Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today, uh, Using Cloud Technology to Enhance Your Mission with Brad Milnes and James Devine uh, from Amazon Web Services. So just before we get started, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. So all callers will be muted. If you have questions, there is a chat box that you guys should see to the left-hand side. So feel free to ask questions throughout the pre uh, presentation, and we'll try and um, tackle them as we go along. And th there will also be a Q&A um, at the end, so the last 15 minutes will be dedicated to Q&A. If you lose your Internet connection, just refresh your browser and use the link that was emailed to you to reconnect. Um, and then if you have to drop off early or you want to watch the webinar again, the webinar will be hosted on TechSoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars. You'll also receive an email with the presentation, the recording, and the links. And if you are on social media, feel free to follow us at TechSoup and use the hashtag TSWebinars. Um, or like I said earlier, you can just send your questions in the Q&A and we will we'll try and get to each of them. So just a little bit about TechSoup before we get started. So we are located in 236 countries and territories. Um, we serve over a million organizations, and we partner with uh, several technology partners like Adobe, Intuit, Microsoft. Um, today Amazon Web Services is here with us. So um, yeah, so this is a little bit about our organization. So uh, I want to give you guys a chance to practice the chat function. So if you guys want to maybe tell me where you're calling in from, and I can read out a few of the places you guys are calling in from. All right, so Michigan, Long Island, Iowa, uh, Denver, Greenville, Bolivia, nice, uh, Indianapolis. So okay, we have people calling in from all over the place, which is nice to see. Um, all right, so uh, just a little bit about our partnership with Amazon Web Services. So if you're curious, once the webinar is over, you can see the link here, uh, techsoup.org slash Amazon dash Web Services. Uh, if you want to find out more once it's over, and the speakers will also be going into, into a little bit of detail uh, towards the end. So now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our presenters. So we have James Devine who is the Nonprofit Solutions Architect with Amazon uh, Web Services. And prior to AWS, he was the Senior Infrastructure Engineer at MITRE where he was a nonprofit government contractor and he helped various government organizations solve some of the toughest problems using cloud computing. And then we also have Brad Milnes who is the nonprofit representative at Amazon Web Services. And he has over five years of supporting nonprofits by helping them to evolve and enhance their technology-based operations. Uh, myself, uh, my name is Seema Tucker, and I'm the online learning producer here at TechSoup. And then we have a couple people who are going to be on the back end helping with chat, so you'll probably see their names. Uh, Lashika, who is the Associate Program Manager here at TechSoup, and then Jamin who is a Program Manager and CSR person over at Amazon Web Services. So he'll be answering any Amazon-related questions. All right, so now I'm going to hand it over. All right. Thank you, Seema. Uh, this is Brad Milnes here. Uh, as Seema just went over, uh, I'm going to be talking about you know, the, the background of the organizations we talk about, and, and then James will uh, dive a little bit into the technical solutions. But what we really aim to do here with this presentation is pick out three use cases um, that have overarching themes that we think will apply to the majority, if not everyone, on this call. Kind of the, the, uh, the big themes we see in nonprofits just getting started with AWS, uh, some of the hurdles that they encounter, and how we've been able to solve them. And um, hopefully you get some useful action items out of this. Um, as Seema said, we're going to have a, an email at the end that please do feel free to reach out with any questions at all. Um, so yeah, we're going to get started here. Just to uh, level set, we just wanted to ask a quick question. We'll give you about 15 seconds to, uh, to answer. Just how familiar are you with Amazon Web Services? Just to kind of set the, the groundwork here. Looks like the majority is, I don't know what AWS is, and heard of AWS but not using it, which is perfect. This is exactly the people we want to talk to, and hopefully the, 
the themes that we cover here um, resonate with you, and then again, we can tell you more about it um, following up if you're interested. Okay, thank you, Seema. Um, so the first organization we're going to touch on here uh, is World Elephant Day. Um, now, the main takeaway that uh, everybody might be able to relate to here is we provided a solution to a small organization that was new to AWS. Judging on those uh, results we just saw, I think a lot of, a lot of organizations here fall into that category. Uh, and this organization specifically dealt with um, seasonal or spiky traffic. And in this case, it's just one day of exceptionally high traffic and then scaling back down to, uh, to just normal everyday operations. So a little bit about World Elephant Day. Uh, it's an international annual event. International is important there. I think James is going to go into that a little bit more. It's on August 12th. It's dedicated to the preservation and protection of the world's elephants. Um, their main objective is to create a, awareness uh, of everything that's going on with elephants. I'm sure many people have heard about the poaching, habitat loss, and just the overall human-elephant conflict uh, that goes on. Uh, from a technical standpoint, they started with just a website. Uh, and then they expanded their marketing and um, social awareness to social media, um, which actually worked very, very well for them. Um, in year three, uh, they saw a massive, ju a massive jump in usage from 30,000 users um, and 70,000 page views. Uh, from a vision standpoint, from a publicity standpoint, this was great news. Unfortunately, they did not have the infrastructure to handle this, so uh, they actually uh, crashed on World Elephant Day for eight hours. You can imagine how critical that is if you have one day that you're ga gaining 90% you know, of your donations from to be down for eight hours. So obviously they lost donations, and along with that comes uh, credibility, uh, the loss of credibility. So uh, their challenge was how can they have a, a website and environment that can scale for this one day um, but they don't have to pay for the capacity the other 364 days. Because traditionally, um, if you have an on-premise solution, uh, you have to be provisioned for that one day of a of huge spike in traffic. Uh, and, and you have to pay for it accordingly, um, which was not something that the World Elephant Day uh, organization could do. They could not afford to do that. Um, so they, we had to provide them with a solution that could scale to those extremes on that day and then scale back down um, when they were not there. And, and now, and from real term world, from real world results, um, it's been a, an extreme success. So China actually banned all commerce and ivory at the end of 2017, and the U.S. is at a near total ban of commercial trade of ivory. Um, so not only have we been able to provide um, the technology that allows them to scale and meet their mission, but um, they've been able to continue to make a real change in the world. And now uh, James is going to go into a little bit of exactly how we help them do that. Thanks, Brad. So I think this is a great use case of, of how we can take uh, the AWS platform and really help our nonprofits um, not only meet their business needs but exceed them. So the, the same great technologies that some of our largest customers like Netflix and Capital One have access to, um, the smallest nonprofit have access to as well. So you, you have that same global platform. Uh, we're, we have 18 regions around the world, and we segment our regions off into availability zones, and we have 53 availability zones within those 18 regions. So um, day one accessing our, our platform, you have access to that global infrastructure. And you can scale resources up and down as needed. So you can imagine World Elephant Day, you know, 364 days out of the year, they don't need the infrastructure that they need for that one day when they need to scale up. So, so using our... Uh, elastic load balancing service. They can dynamically load balance traffic, um, and that can grow as they need. So we couple that with auto scaling, and we can grow their fleet of backend servers right on up to um, you know as big as they need based on customers. So at the more customers they get, the more we'll automatically scale their environment, and they're not having to do anything. They're not needing to sit there and go and manually deploy servers, strap in servers in a data center. Um, it's kind of like the easy button. Um, it's not even a button. It just grows automatically. Uh, we combine that with another service that we have called CloudFront, which is a content distribution network. It allows you to leverage our, our global span. We have over 100 
points of presence around the world um, that connect to our network. So you're, you're able to leverage that and use it for caching and um, speeding up the page views. So, so even though your infrastructure might be hosted um, where we are sitting here on the East Coast, you can serve that content locally from a cached location close to your user, be it uh, in you know, another region around the world or even a different time zone. Um, it'll be served from servers that are close to them and they'll get a, a good user experience that also reduces your infrastructure costs because you don't need to deploy infrastructure globally um, or manage, worry about managing servers in different locations around the world. You can just leverage our CloudFront service. Um, and this even works with your, your websites you use today. We can work, um, put CloudFront in front of your on-prem resources, and within a few minutes you're, you're now distributing your content globally from around the world. So it's a very powerful technology and, and easy to use. Yes, fantastic. Um, and just to reiterate, um, this was a very small organization that was very new to the cloud, um, and we were able to provide them with a, an elastic solution that allowed them to handle extreme uh, traffic uh, for one day. But even if you're seeing you know, spiky traffic throughout the year, um, the same solutions and the same things James just talked about apply as well. Moving on to the next uh, use case here. Um, it's with the White House Historical Association, and the main takeaway here um, is for uh, data uh, migration and storage, which is a common uh, theme we see a lot with um, specifically nonprofits that just need to clear that first hurdle to, to begin their cloud journey on AWS. Uh, you know, how do we get our data onto the platform, um, and where does it go, and how can I store it the most efficient way? Um, so we, we allowed the White House uh, Historical Association to do this and then to utilize our different storage tiers, uh, which we'll go into a little bit here, to, uh, to optimize um, their environment as well as make it the most cost efficient. Uh, so a little bit um, on the background of the White House Historical Association. Uh, their mission is to enhance the public's understanding and appreciation and enjoyment of the White House. Um, basically, they wanted to make an app that could bring the tours and the information that the White House um, provides to visitors of the White House, but they wanted to provide that to people that you know, weren't in Washington, D.C. and could access it from a mobile device. Um, so they wanted to make the White House experience um, educational um, and free and for easy for the public to use. Um, so from a technical standpoint, where they had to come from was they had a small digital library uh, but was looking to expand the volume and content offered uh, to the online visitor to make the White House education more accessible, as I mentioned. Um, it offers historical images, including interior shots, exterior photos, really just you know, files and photos that, that give you the history of the, of the White House. So their main challenge was uh, to develop a new interactive experiences for the public um, and making sure that it was affordable for them uh, and most importantly, um, secure. Uh, and that's a, that's a main theme um, for every customer we have, whether they're nonprofit, whether they're for profit, whether they're small, whether they're large. Uh, security is absolutely our, uh, what we call around here, job zero. And we lock down everything from an infrastructure standpoint on our end as tightly as it possibly can be. And we help you lock it down um, from uh, identity access management tools and things like that on your end. Uh, as you're getting set up. Um, but back to the White House Association, um, so we, we needed to expand their digitization, storage, and sharing of uh, historical artifacts. And in just a couple of add-ons that they added to this project was they actually started a podcast at the same time, and they also um, created an augmented reality app at the same time as well. But those are just two add-ons to the main project here. And James is going to go into a bit more detail of the solution that we helped them with. Thanks, Brad. So uh, I think one of the interesting things about, about this project is there was a lot of, of single source content, so, so images and, and digital files that, that only existed in one location and were really susceptible to, to natural disaster or um, you know, really in threat of just being wiped out of existence because they were a sole source. So um, it only made sense for the, for the White House Historical Association to reach out to AWS to, to you know, talk through how, how do we take these you know, critical pieces of history and, and preserve them. And uh, that's where our, our 
storage service, S3, our simple storage service, really, really shines. So um, we offer three different tiers of it, and that goes from you know, your, your typical just standard tier where you access. Um, we have a uh, infrequent access tier for data that you need rapid access to, but you're not accessing on a regular basis, um, down to our archival tier, uh, which is our, your archival storage, what you'd think of as a typical tape backup type that you put in a bank vault. Um, and that ranges from a few pennies a gigabyte all the way down to our archival, we're down to 0.4 cents per gigabyte. So, so a very economical solution to store uh, data at scale. It's, it's infinitely scalable. We have customers storing multiple petabytes um, of data in this data store. So whether you're storing a gigabyte or you know, multiple petabytes, it'll, it'll scale to your needs. Um, we, we also offer uh, 11 nines of availability and four nines of uptime with this service. Um, with that, to put that into kind of perspective, if you take your, your image files um, of your family, you put them on a hard drive, you put it on the shelf, if you went back to that same hard drive one year from now, three, five years from now, it, the odds are pretty good that that data will, pieces of that data will have been corrupted and, and are no longer actually there. You've lost that data um, just from it sitting on the shelf. With our S3 and the 11 nines of, of durability, that means that it's pretty much statistically an impossibility that you'll lose data which is um, pretty significant when you're talking about storing single source content that you want to be preserved um, you know, in, in perpetuity. So it's great for those type of use cases. Um, with the White House, they were looking at, at over uh, 7 terabytes of data and over 5,000 images, so, so quite a large amount of data. Uh, they, they tied into uh, one of our other services called Snowball, which is our, our offline data import export. So we send you a physical appliance you load your data onto it, and then you send it back to us, and we, we load it up into our S3 storage service. Um, so they leveraged that, so that, that seven terabytes would have taken a long time to transfer over just a, a standard internet connection. Um, so it's a great option for customers that have a lot of data that they want to move over quickly without having to worry about doing a bat, some type of batch job or some type of nightly transfer um, over a limited bandwidth connection. So they were able to, to take advantage of Snowball um, to, to get that data into S3 quickly. Um, so, so now that they did have all their data into S3, um, that's really where, where you can take a full advantage of all of the AWS services. We have, we have over 100 services that we offer, um, so it really is an enabler to uh, power your other services. So like their virtual um, tour of the White House and their, their mobile touring application were really enabled by having all of this content up in S3 um, and being able to do things um, that they had never thought possible before, you know, kind of um, you know, the sky's the limit once you start getting in and having everything in the cloud. You can start leveraging more cloud services and tying them together to make a really immersive user experience. Um, and, and for nonprofits in general, to be able to engage your, your customers or your, your um, donors in, in new and unique ways that you might not have been able to do before. Yeah, thanks, James. That's a great point. You know, I mean, the main takeaway here was helping the White House Association transfer a large amount of data and just get it on AWS, but James is exactly right. Once it's there, uh, we have over 120 services. Uh, depending on what your mission is or, or what your you know, vision is, um, there are an array of options to you know, a different, different ways to analyze, um, to visualize, and really just to use data to your uh, advantage to advance your missions. Going on to the third use case, um, it, it deals with change management and cloud adoption, um, and we did this with Conservation International. Uh, now the main takeaway here is taking a large amount of data again, but now this time making sense of it and providing actionable insights uh, for your organization and to bring to the public. Um, a little bit on Conservation International, um, their focus is to uh, make connections between human well-being and natural ecosystems. And they do this by actually partnering with indigenous groups in these areas to educate them um, on what's going on with the data as it, as it um, pertains to nature, uh, as well as uh, provide them with financial support to actually take uh, action on these uh, insights. Um, Conservation International has held 1,200 protected areas uh, and, and interventions across 77 countries. Uh, they've committed to the protection of what are called biodiversity hotspots. They've identified 34, 34 such hotspots around the world. 
and the model for protecting these hotspots has become a way for organizations outside of Conservation International to do uh, different types of conservation work. Um, so not only did they find a way to um, bring all their, aggregate all the data together, but they've also opened up their model to other organizations that have a, a real impact uh, going forward. And um, if that's something that your organization is interested in, uh, it's absolutely a possibility. Um, so a little bit about them from a technology standpoint. Um, as I mentioned, they focus on relationships with uh, communities have with their environments, um, specifically with the policymakers and, and how they can help their societies be more resilient to natural disasters, climate change, and things like this. Uh, so what they wanted to do was create an application um, to identify environmental stressors and make that data publicly available um, so that governments, local governments, or just you know, uh, local influencers could digest it um, and actually use it to help the people um, in their communities. One of the, one example of this is in Ethiopia um, with, the, uh, with the crops as, as they pertain to rainfall or the changing amounts of rainfall. Um, they actually laid out uh, and visualized the resilience of crops um, as, they, as it pertains to decreasing rainfall. Um, which is something that is incredibly valuable to the people who make a livelihood um, farming the various crops that come out of Ethiopia. Um, and, a, and as a result, wh where this data was visualized was actually on an app called uh, Resilience Atlas. Uh, and James is going to go into a little bit more detail on that now. Thanks, Brad. So. Um, the, the app that they were able to put together, uh, Resilience Atlas, it, you can actually access it now in your web browser, res, resilienceatlas.org. It's, it's a pretty interesting application. It, it's real time. You can choose different layers that you want to enable or disable and um, see the map uh, change and update in, in real time. And on the back end, that's using our scalable infrastructure, um, like we've talked about before, our auto scaling and load balancing. So they're able to uh, launch that and scale up and down. So whether it's just me on my computer here accessing the website or say some of our number of people on the call go to that website now, um, that, that back-end infrastructure will, din will dynamically scale up and down. And they're only paying for the infrastructure as they need it. Um, so you know, obviously the, the infrastructure you need for one person and several hundred people um, or the day after launch is going to be significantly different. So, so you're able to scale up and down and meet that customer demand. Um, the, the interactive web application is pretty unique in that um, they're able to take over 60 data sets that were siloed into individual data sets that were composed over 12 terabytes of data and combine them all together. So, so making useful um, models out of this, this disparate data set that, that really wasn't possible um, you know, without being in a cloud environment. So having that flexibility to be able to use S3 for all of our storage, our database services, like our relational database services that are, that are fully managed, um, our Redshift, um, which is our, our data warehousing solution, it's our uh, petabyte scale data warehouse. They're able to leverage all of these services and create this interactive application um, that really puts power in the hands of the average user to, to go onto this website and um, go in to make their own discoveries and, and leverage this data in new and unique ways. Um, at the same time, also, providing this powerful platform to researchers and universities and, and other organizations that, that wanted to have access to it. So we see this a lot with, with nonprofits um, that have a lot of data, you know, being able to share it and exchange that data and make it more useful. So there's, there's a lot of disparate data sets that, that we find as we talk to customers. And uh, it's a common use case to, to want to be able to combine them and put them together, um, take advantage of our artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms and offerings in our platform. So, so you get advantage, advantages of all of that by, by using the cloud platform. Uh, another unique thing that uh, Conservative Conservation International was able to do um, was really leverage the, the, the elasticity of the cloud. So they leveraged what we call our spot market. So you have the ability to bid on excess compute capacity that is kind of just sitting around waiting for other customers to use it. So they're able to, to spin up 120 servers for a few days run their job, and then um, power it all down. And they were able to do this for a fraction of the cost of what it would have cost to do that um, on our traditional, um, you know, traditional infrastructure. It also would have taken many weeks if they had done it on-prem in their traditional type of environment. So 
they're able to spin up these 120 servers, crunch through their data, and then power them off, and only pay for them for that brief period of time at a reduced rate. Um, so again, another really powerful use case of, of how using AWS can, can really empower nonprofits to do big things that really wasn't possible before um, cloud computing and, and taking advantage of all of the services that we offer. Yeah, thank you, James. And just a couple things just to reiterate. Uh, the spot instances is 100% is a cost uh, saving measure. Um, we have plenty of information on that on our site, but definitely a cost saving measure that we have um, multiple different ways to utilize a cloud like that to optimize uh, costs in that way. Um, and the other thing is just uh, bringing data together from multiple different silos. I think we can all relate to the fact that every the data is coming at us from all different directions these days. And this is a great uh, example of how we could, as James said, break down those silos and bring all the data together and make it into actionable insights. It's just uh, one of many uh, examples we, can, we have of, uh, of that. Because obviously it's a huge hurdle for many organizations, whether you're small, large, or we're in between. Uh, there's just data everywhere, and we need to find a way to aggregate it and, and communicate it. So moving on, um, those are our three use cases that hopefully resonated with pretty much everyone on the call um, with their overarching themes. Uh, now we want to go into a couple partnerships that we have. Uh, Seema um, alluded to one earlier in regards to TechSoup, and that, uh, we'll, we'll bring that up after we talk about digital divide data. Uh, this is a, a relatively new um, partner of ours. Uh, it's a social enterprise that, in, uh, that focuses on impact sourcing. Um, what they do is they actually provide employment to youth uh, from disadvantaged families with the training and certification um, of, for technical skills uh, in AWS. Um, different things like data management, digital archiving, uh, really, these partners, we partnered up with them specifically for nonprofits to provide a cost-efficient way for nonprofits that, um, you know, might not have the funds for traditional managed service partners uh, to utilize them to help get their cloud environment started, uh, help them with the initial migrations we touched on a little bit, help them with getting their accounts set up and everything like that. Um, really just helps you get clear the first couple hurdles and allows you to get familiar with the platform uh, at very reasonable rates. Um, we actually partnered with them, Digital Divide Data, the first cloud academy class is what we're calling them, was in Kenya. Um, about 35 young adults, 18 to 22, actually went through the training program, a rigorous training program, got certified at the end. Uh, every single one of them passed the exam and now they are um, you know, certified solutions architects um, from AWS. Uh, so they're very, very bright people that can do um, anything that our solutions architects can do and, and really help you get over the, uh, the hump of, of some of the, the obstacles that we see uh, small nonprofits and small new customers in general face um, going forward. And, um, and that's something, as, as Seema alluded to earlier, we're going to have a, uh, an email at the end here. If you want more information on exactly what that uh, offer looks like, we will gladly send it your way if you email that, um, that uh, address at the end. And secondly, our – oh, we wanted to do a poll question here um, just to gauge the community again. Um, would your organization benefit from using a managed service provider like Digital Divide Data? Give you a couple seconds here. So basically, do you have in-house in techno technologists or do you not? So it's actually a pretty even split here. What we're seeing here. Literally, uh, everybody's answered. It's 56 to 55. But very good to know. And somebody just tied it up. 56 to all. That's really interesting. Thank you for your responses. Uh, the second partner we want to uh, highlight here are our gracious hosts, 
TechSoup. Um, we have a partnership with them that really helps nonprofits, um, sometimes just getting started, sometimes to take care of all their costs, depending on your, environmental, your environment's needs. Uh, we have a partnership with them that if you pay $175, you can get $2,000 worth of AWS credits, um, and you can do that on a, on a yearly basis. Um, so again, really helpful for people just getting started. Even if you just want to test it out, kind of run your own proof of concept, we see that a lot. Uh, we see people using the $2,000 for their entire first year spend. Uh, and really, we, and, and the third scenario is just getting used to the, to the environment as they scale up. Uh, it really reduces the risk uh, that we know nonprofits um, you know, can't usually take on a, a lot of the times because of funding and things like that. Uh, in addition to the $2,000, um, you also get no cost technical guidance, as you can see. The nonprofit office hours, um, they're really good. They're, James, are they every, what? The, uh, every third you, Tuesday? Yeah, every third Wednesday of the month. Every third Wednesday of the month, uh, we host them. Uh, and anybody's, everybody's welcome. Um, you can just join. Usually the solutions architect have a topic that they talk about or want to highlight, uh, and then there's a Q&A session at the end where you can ask any questions, whether it's on the topic or just um, in general. Uh, and as you can see here, trainings, case studies. Uh, and coming soon, there's actually an Amazon partner network, um, nonprofit competency um, that's going to just focus strictly on nonprofits, so like DDD that I just mentioned, but just a, an entire partner network like that. So, um, so that's coming soon as well. That wraps it up for us. What we're really hoping to get um, out of this is, is more questions from you. Uh, what's on top of mind of, of TechSoup users uh, that are just getting started on, the, uh, on their cloud journeys? Um, feel free to provide any feedback that was helpful, if the, use, if the ca use, uh, cases were uh, useful or helpful to you. Um, but really now we just want to, we're hoping that we can use the rest of this time for questions that you have. All right, I'm just going to jump back in. Thank you guys for the helpful presentation. Um, again, if you have questions for them, uh, feel free to email them directly at the email that you see here. So now we're going to move into the Q&A. So if you guys have questions, uh, please use the chat box. And we have about uh, 15 to 20 minutes to answer your questions. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, the first one that I see here. So um, the first question is, we currently keep a lot of data on Google Drive, but don't necessarily need to share it with the public. Are AWS services primarily for public sharing? I think either of you guys could probably answer that question. Yep. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. So um, we, we have a few different options. So, so all of our services are available through public endpoints. Um, that's not to say that they, they need to be um, you know, access, accessible public. So we have the ability um, to, within your part of the Amazon network, it's called a VPC, a virtual private cloud. Um, that's kind of like an extension of a non-premise data center. So you can spin up resources within that VPC and uh, that's your private part of the network. Um, even though it's a multi-tenant environment, um, no one else has access to that. You can limit access to services like S3 to only um, co originate from that um, VPC. There's also um, you know, a number of our services um, have a way to connect to them privately and not open them up to the, to the world. So um, by all means, you can have private resources within AWS. That's one of our strengths um, and the security that we have around that. Um, and we also have other solutions like our WorkDocs um, is a, doc, a similar document collaboration um, and sharing platform uh, that, that you could look at leveraging as well um, for, for that type of central shared document repository. And you can do fine-grained permissions with that, share to, share to public, not share to public, and allow users to um, collaborate within your organization. Great. Okay. Um, so the next question is, in terms of, um, because AWS does offer so many you know, different types of services, uh, what do you guys recommend in terms of like, where to start, and you know, is it just 
basic storing files or hosting a website, kind of do you guys have a recommendation? Um, you know, especially if there's a lot of small nonprofits on the line, what's a good kind of starting point and progression after? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, dealing primarily with uh, startups or nonprofits that are just getting started up, um, almost every customer uses uh, our EC2, Elastic Compute Cloud uh, service, as well as S3, uh, the, uh, the storage. Um, these are the building blocks of AWS. These are, are what you're going to need, pretty much every organization needs, whether you're just starting um, or you're advanced in your cloud uh, journey. Um, those are the two that you're going to want to start with. And also there's a ton of resources online that we have that, that will walk you through step-by-step -step on exactly how to get started. Um, because ultimately it does depend on your needs, um, but EC2 and S3, they're going to be um, – they're going to be an element of pretty much everyone's startup story, and um, and there's other other documents online that can help you walk through the uh, the other the other uh, services. Yeah, and to and to follow up on that, I think thinking we like to think in terms of workloads at AWS. So uh, your type of your typical website. So we see customers do like dev test type workloads. So it's always good if you're starting a net new application. Um, you know why not deploy it in the cloud? Why not think cloud first? Um, but if you're not deploying applications, you know, at pretty much every nonprofit has a website. And with these $2,000 um, TechSoup credits, that's, that's from, for a wide majority of our uh, customers, that's more than enough to run your complete web infrastructure on AWS in a highly available manner for, for a year. So that's a great place to start um, with your, your public website. Uh, pretty much every organization has one, and you want to make sure that that's up and available especially if you're doing things like taking donations or, you know, that is your critical um, web presence. You probably get more visits um, to that than any, uh, the, any other resource you have. So putting that on um, out there and getting that working and highly available is, is a great place to start. Great. Okay. Um, so we have another question uh, kind of along the same lines. Um, are AWS services used in place of traditional web hosting, or do you, do you still need a web host? Or does AWS act as a web host? Sure. And, and the answer to that is um, it, it really depends what you're trying to do. So if you're talking about your traditional like hosting domain names, you can register domain names with, with AWS. You can transfer your domain names and use our highly uh, available and fault-tolerant um, domain name service called Route 53. Um, so we see some customers starting off with that. Um, so you can use your traditional host and leverage us for, for what we call name hosting. Um, you can also just fully move to AWS. There, there's no need for your traditional web host. Um, and, and most web hosts that, that you go, like you go to you know, insert your, your favorite name here, um, where you pay like five, ten bucks a month, um, that's on a shared infrastructure. So um, someone else on that same server, if they go under heavy load and get, say, like a thousand, they become really popular and take off, that could adversely affect your performance. Uh, we don't do that type of provisioning at, at AWS. Um, we make sure that we have dedicated resources. So we have um, a tier of service called um, LightSail. I'm sorry, <laughs> minor brain fart. Uh, it's called LightSail. So it's specifically tiered toward that. You know, you only need like a single running server. Um, we have some easy management around it. Um, so within you know five to ten minutes, you can click around the console, and for a, a flat monthly fee, it covers the the server. Um, we'll, there's some quick start launches for things like WordPress and um, Drupal, some common website platforms. So um, you know in five to ten minutes, you can have your website up and running in, in its basic form. So um, we definitely have a, a, a wide range of services. So even just your simple web hosting, um, we can do that uh, definitely. You don't need to go have a maintain your third party. And we can cover it with those TechSoup credits, so, so you're not paying anything extra for that. Great. Okay. Um, so we have some technical questions that are coming through. So uh, in regards to the Resilient Atlas app, um, somebody was asking, is this Resilient Atlas app running on a GIS application like ARC GIS? I'm probably butchering that, but... Yeah, it's ArcGIS. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not specifically sure what, what they are implementing. Um, given how fast and responsive and you know, scalable it is, I, I 
say they, they necessarily aren't, but it, we can certainly follow up if you send us an email and you have um, some, you want some more information around those type of use cases. Um, ArcGIS and geospatial data is something that comes up uh, quite frequently um, with our customer base. So, so we certainly can run that on the platform, and if you have more questions, we can certainly dive in deeper. Okay. Um, so we have another technical question. Can VPC integrate with Active Directory? Yeah, so they're, they're kind of different. Um, your, your VPC is kind of like a networking, your private part of the AWS um, environment in terms of networking. So we can put a VPN connection onto that VPC so you can connect back to your on-premise environment, which would allow you to extend your Active Directory into AWS. Um, that said, we do have a number of other services as well, like our, our AD connector, which allows you to um, connect back to on-premise and do things like domain joins and other types of um, your typical domain interaction without actually having to set up a domain controller within AWS. Um, so, so we do have a, a, a bunch of different um, options there for deploying Active Directory and connecting into AWS. Uh, very common for, for our customers um, to want to extend their, their existing directories into the cloud. Um, and again, that, that email address, we can pop it up um, before the end just mm -hmm. so you um, have that. If, you, if there's other, any other questions, we can dive a little deeper into that. And Seymour, just for, to clarify, I actually just jump back one question. If the question was, does ArcGIS run on AWS, uh, the answer is yes to that. I'm not sure if that was the question, but if you need more information, then just please email us. Yeah, that was the question. Yeah. And then I'll just pull up the email really fast in case uh, if people didn't get a chance to write it down. Um, okay, so another question is, can AWS be used as a backup that syncs continuously? So, um, yes is the, the short answer. Um, the, the longer answer is it, it really depends on your use case. We um, have a, a, a very flexible platform, so we, we fully support a hybrid type of cloud. So if you have on-premise resources that you'd want to back up into AWS, that's another uh, very common use case where we see customers you know, have an on-premise server or on-premise systems, and they want to be able to back it up to the cloud. Um, definitely that's supported. Services like S3, um, are a great place to do that uh, economically too. If it's if it's just archival backup, you can use Glacier at 0 0.4 cents um, or 0 0.4 cents per gigabyte. Um, so definitely a very uh, cost economical way to store that data. We also have can, um, products like our storage gateway, which allow you to extend cloud storage to on-prem in a hybrid manner. So it's all backed up to our massively scalable and flexible cloud storage, but you still have access to it on on-premise. Um, and there's, there's third-party applications, too, that backup applications that utilize S3. I use one on my desktop um, that does a daily backup to S3. So, and I've actually used it. So my, my, my system had crashed before. Um, I'm not going to say what platform it is, but it crashed. And I was able to pull all my ba data back down from S3 um, before I even had my new computer ready to, to get up and running. So um, definitely a great, great case for backup. And just to add real quickly, you're hearing James say it depends on your workload a lot. Uh, which is actually one of the beautiful things about AWS and the cloud uh, is that it really is personalized uh, to exactly what you need. So you're only paying for what you use, what you need. Um, with AWS specifically, you can turn services on and off um, at will. There are, there are no contracts. Um, so if you're getting benefit out of it, you can scale up. If you're not, you can turn it off and you, get, you stop getting charged uh, right away. Um, so the flexibility is absolutely one of the uh, greatest advantages. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I think this will be probably our last question. So um, can you go into a little bit more detail uh, the difference between S3 and CloudFront? And then also um, another, I guess, uh, part of the S3, somebody was asking to provide a signi significant number of images to a website. Is S3 effective alone or does it need to be combined with CloudFront? Okay, that, that's both good questions and a great follow-up to one another. So um, CloudFront is our, our global content distribution network. Um, it can be used in front of S3. S3 is a regional service. So um, you know, where we are in U.S. East, we have the U.S. East 1 region. So if your files are stored in that region and you want to access, say you have uh, uh, images on your website, you know, trying to put both those questions together, you have images on your website 
and you'll have users in Europe. Well, you might want to put CloudFront in front of that S3 bucket so you're storing your um, files directly from CloudFront. So if a user accesses your website from Europe, they're not reaching all the way back to the U.S. to download that image. Um, it'll be cached in Europe and be served uh, with, with a lot lower latency. And then you're not paying that, that back called data charge because it, you're paying the data charge rates that are from CloudFront and not from the, the S3 directly. Um, so a little bit of a discount there. Um, in, in terms of, of cost overall of the service, um, it really, it, it's only benefit add. Putting um, CloudFront in front of your website, in front of your S3 bucket, in front of an elastic load balancer, um, the, the possibilities are, are pretty endless in what you can just put it in front of, and it's easy to, to get up and run. It's not like um, you know, some of the legacy providers where you have to go out and sign a contract and, and negotiate rates and negotiate bandwidth. Um, you can go up, uh, click through the console today and launch it in, in under five minutes and, and be serving your content globally, which, which is pretty powerful, especially for uh, a nonprofit um, that d doesn't have the budget to go out and make those big contracts with CDNs. Perfect. Um, so I, I lied. There's actually a couple really good questions that just came in, um, if you guys don't mind answering them. Um, so somebody was asking, how does AWS integrate with databases? So we use QuickBooks, Microsoft Access, and a donor database. Um, are all file types supported? Sure. So I, in S3, you, you can upload uh, any type of file that, that you'd like. We, we don't care what type of extension is. Um, it can go up to um, very large sizes as well um, for single for single files. Um, so, so pretty much anything you can run on-prem today, um, you can run in the cloud. Um, so in terms of like your traditional relational databases, um, we try to make things easier for you wherever we can. So our relational database service is uh, definitely something we see a lot of a lot of nonprofits take take advantage of. You're not having to deploy your underlying application. Um, your, your relational database and the operating system. You don't need to manage that. We take that heavy lifting. We take care of that heavy lifting for you. That's one of the things that um, you know. Having a DBA go and manage the database and do operating system updates, um, especially in smaller organizations with limited staff, um, your, your DBA could be doing so much more powerful things, um, like you know, getting into business analytics and artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we like to take care of that. We call it undifferentiated heavy lifting. So wherever we can help our customers do things better and quicker, um, you know, we, we really try to do that. So RDS is a, a great service for, for databases. Okay. Um, and then there's another really good one. So I'm going to go ahead and ask it if you guys don't mind. But uh, the question is, do you have the cloud set up like the third-party application that backs up to the cloud? Um, some are still not comfortable with putting everything mainly on the cloud in case their Internet stops working. So, I mean, there's third-party applications, so you certainly could use something like, um, you know, like a Time Machine or a Windows backup locally, and then back that data up into S3. Um, you know, you, that, that is, you know, when you're using a cloud service, you do need that cloud connectivity. I know the, the client I run on my laptop, um, I, I frequently travel, I might be on an airplane when, when there certainly is not enough bandwidth to do that backup. Um, but I just pause the backup application and wait till I have a good internet connection again. So um, there, there's ways around that. And using third-party applications to, to kind of queue up and wait until it's actually a good time to, act, to do that backup um, is, is a good way to, to handle that. Uh, but you do need a, a connection to do that backup. Uh, we do have another, a few services for applications, one of which is called Workspaces. So it's a virtual desktop in the cloud. One of the advantages of using a service like that is it's backed up um, nightly. You don't need to worry about the backup. Um, we handle that for you. So, so there are additional services that you can use to um, really leverage your business and, and give um, remote parties access, a uh, number of advantages to using things like uh, workspaces. And also AppStream 2.0 is our, another one of our application streaming services. So you can stream applications directly from a, any modern web browser. Um, so we see customers use that for that exact reason, um, to simplify their backup and uh, give more accessibility options to their users. All right, perfect. Um, okay, so I think that covers most of the questions for today. Um, thanks again for your presentation. Um, I just have a few things to cover before we clo uh, close out today's webinar. So 
just really quick, it's always fun to see kind of what people learned in the webinar today. So if you guys don't mind just chatting one new thing <coughs> that you learned in today's webinar. And then after the webinar is over, um, you should receive a post-event survey. Um, that feedback is really helpful to us because we, you know, it helps us dictate what kind of content you guys enjoy um, and if you're finding what we're providing valuable. So it's about 10 questions um, just to understand kind of where you're, out, where you're at in your cloud technology process and then also um, can, can give us some guidance on future content. Uh, and then for social media, if you guys are on social media, we have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We love social media love. So if you guys want to give us a like or a follow, we post a lot of valuable content on there, including blog posts and upcoming webinars. Um, we also have a blog, which is blog.techsoup.org. Um, again, we post a lot of tips and tricks and um, impact stories and, and things that you guys might find um, interesting. And then also we have several webinars coming up in March. So we have a series of QuickBooks webinars. Um, we also added a couple new ones. On the 20th we have Okta and City Year are going to be sharing their story about single sign-on. And then on the 27th we have a digital, um, I'm going to try and remember the name, Digital Trends in Fundraising uh, for 2018. So I'll um, make sure the website's updated with all of this information. All right, so thanks again to our presenters. And then also I just want to take a moment to thank our webinar sponsors, ReadyTalk, and thanks to you guys for attending today's webinar.